So welcome. It's very nice to see all of you here today on such a beautiful day. Um, I'd like to introduce Juan Zarate, who is going to, I'm normally, I introduce somebody and say what they are, but it's actually, I wanted to hear Juan talk a little bit about his life. That's going to be my first question. So I will introduce him in this way. Um, Juan is somebody I've known for, I don't know how many years, maybe eight, for a long time. He's been, in addition to all the wonderful things he does for the government, which we're going to talk about, has been one of the people uh, inside Washington who's been the most generous to those of us who are, are not in Washington and who don't really understand what's going on until somebody levels with us and is willing to take the time to, to sit down with both novices and people who have, you know, are paying attention the best they can and explain it to them in a non-combative way, in a non-defensive way. And it's made a kind of um, intellectual engagement possible. And so that's my introduction. Now, I, now I'm going to turn to you and say that um, you know, there's a lot of books starting to come out about the post-9-11 era. And if, for those of us who, who pay attention to this world, um, the, um, the Treasury's role is never talked about. And yet, once you see it, you begin to see that it's a gem in, in the mix. And so one of the problems with writing a book like this is I never really wanted someone to pay attention to Treasury. I was hoping that it would be left alone <laughs> because everything else that gets paid attention to, it's just a disaster. So, um, so, um, so th that's my introduction to the book. And, and I want to talk a little bit about it. I hope you don't think it's a disaster. No, the book is wonderful. I, I mean, for me, obviously, I, I loved reading it for a billion reasons, but, um, and I'm recommending it to everybody. But um, I wanted to start a little bit with you telling us a little bit about who you are and how you got to Treasury in this position and talk about it, and then, and then we'll talk about the book. Well, Karen, first of all, I want to thank you and your team here at Fordham for having me. As you know, and we'll do a little bit of backslapping here, I'm a huge fan of yours and all the work that you've always done. I don't all, always agree with you, uh, <laughs> but I think that's that's the sign of a healthy relationship and healthy um, intellectual discourse. And so I've always loved listening to you and watching what you built and worked on. And so I want to thank you for having me here at Fordham and your team. Uh, you've done a great job. Um, I'm not going to make this an Oprah session, so there's no crying allowed. Uh, and you're not getting free books under your chair either. <laughs> uh, I'm not but, a cough. <laughs> <laughs> um, there's someone in the audience actually who knew me pre Treasury. Um, and I just want to uh, call him out because he's, I consider him a, a hero of mine, somebody that I learned uh, at the feet of uh, when there was a, a sort of smaller group of people working on Al Qaeda and, and uh, terrorism issues. Bob McFadden is uh, seated here, uh, one of the great uh, professionals and investigators from the Naval Criminal Investigative Investigatory Service. Um, I had the, the deep and dear experience of watching Bob do great work in Yemen uh, in the wake of the USS Cole attack. Um, I was a, then a junior prosecutor um, in the terrorism and violent crime section at DOJ. Uh, I had been assigned to the embassy bombings case to help Pat Fitzgerald uh, on some discovery issues. Again, I had just graduated from law school and done a clerkship, and so I was given some pretty uh, menial tasks, but I was frankly honored to be a part of that team uh, and uh, had my eyes open to the reality that Al-Qaeda would have been at war with us. Uh, and we saw that over and over again, and I got to watch the great work of folks like Bob McFadden and Ali Soufan and others uh, in the field trying to uh, unravel Al-Qaeda, understand them, and try to prevent the next attack. So, Prior to 9-11, that was my job. I was a mainline terrorism prosecutor at the Department of Justice, um, learning from some great uh, people there in, in Southern District of New York and in Washington. Um, in July of 2001, I got a call from uh, an associate um, who was joining the team at Treasury. Um, and it was then that, that the Treasury had what was called the Office of Enforcement. Keep in mind that the Office of Enforcement held 40% of federal law enforcement. The Treasury at the time housed the historic law enforcement agencies of the Secret Service, the Customs Service, uh, IRS criminal investigators, Bureau of Alcohol, Tobacco, and Firearms, the Federal Law Enforcement Training Center. Uh, these were big gorillas in the uh, law enforcement world, and these were the guns and badges that gave Treasury its weight in the national security arena. 
Um, and so I, I was being recruited to go uh, serve on a senior policy team uh, to work with the then Undersecretary for Enforcement on all things international that related to enforcement, anti-money laundering, <laughs> customs enforcement, uh, all these sorts of things. I arrived three weeks before 9-11. Um, and um, my second week on the job, I got to go to Paris with all the sort of community of actors who do anti-money laundering sort of the prototypic tre treasury trip, you know, you go to a, a nice capital in Europe and you have sip coffee and have tea with all sorts of uh, finance officials. Uh, but I came back to treasury um, and 9-11 happened. And um, I remember that day vividly because um, I at that time had a, uh, an office on the fourth floor of the treasury department which looked south. So I could see across the river to the Pentagon. And we were watching what was happening in New York on the TV screen. And I was also watching the flames and the smoke rise over the Potomac uh, Pentagon. And I remember I was on the phone, and, and Bob will know these names. Uh, I was on the phone with George Koskis, who is a fellow prosecutor now, Deputy Assistant uh, Attorney General in the National Security Division. Um, after the first plane hit, because I got on the phone, I said, George, have folks at Maine Justice seen this? You guys looked at this, because it's really something problematic, hadn't seen it. Um, the usual protocol was to get over to the FBI PSYOP to start coordinating uh, the investigation or the response. Um, then the second plane hit, and I was on the phone then with the section chief, Jim Reynolds, who was just three weeks before my boss. Uh, and we were talking about all the rumors swirling around 9-11. There was a rumor of a car bomb going off at the State Department. There were rumors of other attacks happening. And he asked me, he said, there's also a rumor that the Pentagon and I said, Jim, it's not a rumor. I can see it right in front of me. Uh, and then just a few minutes later, the sirens went off and we evacuated. Uh, a small group of us went to the Secret Service headquarters to sort of wait the rest of the day and, and to watch the skies. We were actually just waiting for the planes to hit. Um, that's sort of a long-winded intro uh, to explain my entry into this world and the entry of Treasury Department into this new war, this new phase. Because on September 12th, 2001, the Treasury Department was asked to take a different role, to take a seat at the table in terms of using its tools, authorities, relationships in a much more aggressive way to go after Al-Qaeda's financing and to, to try to undercut the financing of terrorist groups. And that, in some ways, began this new era of financial warfare that saw the evolution of new tools, new powers, financial intelligence that were brought to bear against some of the hardest of our national security issues. And I was very fortunate in that I had the background of understanding Al-Qaeda, having worked with folks like Bob and others in the community, uh, that the Secretary and others looked to me to provide support, strategies, et cetera. Um, and I was very fortunate to, to then become a Deputy Assistant Secretary and ultimately an Assistant Secretary, uh, the first ever for these issues uh, for the Treasury Department. So talk a little bit about what it meant to set up the apparatus that led to Treasury's war, the, the Department of Treasury that was actually going to go after terrorist financing and have, what, how that came about. Well, there's actually two interesting phases to this because the, in the immediate aftermath of 9-11, there was no question uh, the Treasury and its tools and its authorities to freeze assets, to track money, to follow money trails was sort of the center of the storm. Lots of hearings about it, lots of um, uh, newspaper articles. Um, and in fact, the first act taken by the U.S. President after 9-11 related to the war on terror was not a bombing action in Afghanistan, not an invasion somewhere, but was the signing of an executive order on September 24, 2001 that gave the Secretary of the Treasury much more uh, ample and aggressive power to freeze the assets of not just terrorist groups and individuals like a bin Laden or Zawakari, but those that were financially supporting them and those that were fin providing financial facilitation, so the bankers, potentially. And even beyond that, sort of you think of this in rings, those associated with those. And so the Treasury was given enormous powers, along then with the Patriot Act, uh, to go after these networks, to freeze assets, to build a financial intelligence structure, uh, to then um, be a part of, of an effort to disrupt uh, Al-Qaeda. What's interesting though, Karen, I try to chronicle this in the second part of the book, is we went through a very interesting and um, debilitating institutional phase though. Uh, 
that despite the fact that Treasury is being asked to do so much, including with its enforcement arts, Customs and Secret Service, along with the FBI, <coughs> um, what happened with the creation of the Department of Homeland Security was the defanging of the Treasury Department. Because all of those institutions that I mentioned, Secret Service, Customs, ATF, were literally ripped out of the department. Um, and in many ways created an existential moment for the Treasury because the question then was what is Treasury's role in the enforcement and security world if its largest and most important assets are now gone? Um, and I remember, and I relay this in the book, I was left behind to sort of lead the remnants of what was left behind, and I'll explain that in a second. But I remember those immediate sort of uh, you know, next few weeks after these decisions were made, where the questions were being raised at the White House by other agencies, including the Department of Justice and others, as to why Treasury was even at these meetings. And so I actually, we had to go to meetings and actually defend actually being there at the table. And our realization was, not only do we have to explain to others why Treasury has a role to play, but we need to fundamentally rethink how it is that we're using Treasury powers and tools and authorities. Because in many ways, it's not the guns and badges that made Treasury powerful. It was the ability to affect financial markets and players, the banks of the world, the central banks of the world, the finance ministries, <coughs> the anti-money laundering community, our ability to reach globally in the financial system. That's what makes Treasury unique. It wasn't the fact that we could arrest somebody at the border. It was the fact that we could arrest assets in any corner of the world if we had the right uh, information and the right tools and powers. So can you give us an example? Can you talk about things that, I mean, that you can now talk about of uh, an instance where you went after a group, um, maybe a person, and how you did it and what happened? I think the, the best <laughs> example of these powers um, came with respect to North Korea. Keep in mind um, that when we developed the tools and the strategies against terrorist groups and terrorist financing, what we ultimately decided to do was to migrate and transform those strategies to deal with other rogue actors that we were worried about from a national security perspective. And the underlying theory is if there's a group that wants to do harm to the US, it has to access the banking system, the financial system, non-bank financial institution if it wants global reach. If it's to be of significance, a transnational organized crime group, a drug cartel, or a nation state. And what we started to do was to look around the world to see, to see how are our enemies, the key enemies of the United States in the early 2000s, leveraging the banking system, le leveraging the international financial system, and what are our strategies to actually try to exclude them, to freeze them out of the system, to make it harder for them to raise or move money around the world. So as we looked at the landscape, it was clear that North Koreans were a prime target. Prime target for lots of reasons. They're developing a nuclear program. But more importantly for our purposes, actually a great target because they were known as the Soprano State. They were engaged in every form of criminality that you can imagine, driven by the state. So drug trafficking, remember the Pong Su, the major shipment uh, captured by the Australian Special Forces. Uh, cigarette smuggling, uh, keep in mind the smoking dragon case and, um, and royal charm cases that the FBI and Secret Service had on the east and west coast of the U.S. Um, they even had a Tony Soprano-like wedding around one of these <laughs> it was fantastic. Um, proliferation, proliferation finance, keep in mind it was the North Koreans that were helping the Syrians develop their nuclear program and North Korean scientists that were there. And interestingly, from a Treasury perspective and a Secret Service perspective, uh, the purveyors and creators of the most sophisticated counterfeit of U.S. currency in the world, uh, the U.S. $100 bill, uh, known colloquially within the U.S. government as the supernote, because it is so good. And I guarantee you, if I pass the supernote around uh, to the audience here, you would not be able to tell the difference between a, a, a real hundred and a supernote. That's part of the reason why we keep changing the hundred dollar bill to keep, yeah. keep ahead of some of the counterfeit. Um, so this is a, this is a, a criminal state engaged in illicit financial activity and all the money laundering attached to it. And the reality was, Karen, despite the orthodoxy in Washington of well, you can't do much more to North Korea or Iran. We don't trade with them. We've had decades of sanctions. They don't have many assets in the U.S. So what are you going to do? The reality is these 
uh, institutions and, and regimes actually rely on banks and you know, rely on the financial system to do what they need to do, whether it's to you know, develop a nuclear program or to get cigarettes uh, that are counterfeit across the world. Uh, and so what we did was we looked at the financial map, kind of like a battle plan, and we saw where the North Koreans were most vulnerable, where they had uh, the relationships that mattered in terms of banking. And they had a number of them, uh, including one in Vienna, Golden Star Bank, that we eventually shut down along with the Austrians. Um, there was one bank in Macau called Banco Delta Asia, a small private bank run by the casino magnate Stanley Ho. Um, and that was a bank that was doing everything, basically, for the North Koreans. It was allowing them to deposit counterfeit currency. It was money laundering. It was giving bank accounts to Office 39, which is the intelligence service sort of money laundering organization, criminal organization for the regime. What we said we would do was, as part of our bad bank initiative, finding the bad and weak links in the system, um, we're going to identify this bank uh, as a primary money laundering concern, because it is. It's a risk to the international financial system. It's a risk to the U.S. financial system. Um, it's behaving badly. It's facilitating bad behavior. <laughs> So we're going we're gonna to identify this primary money laundering concern. We're going to use this new tool in Title III of the Patriot Act called Section 311 that gives the Secretary of the Treasury the authority to put this scarlet letter on an institution or a jurisdiction or a class of transactions to say, you've got to be really careful because they're dangerous or they're problematic or suspect. And what we're going to do is we're going to let the market know that this is a problematic bank and they're banking for the North Koreans. Um, for two years, we debated this as part of the North Korea strategy. And so I would go into meeting after meeting trying to explain to people what this was. And for the most part, people, not because people weren't smart, brilliant people, but people um, understood sanctions and financial power through the lens of what we were doing in the 1990s, which was trade-based or diplomatically driven sanctions. And even if they were targeted, they were usually targeted at regime leaders mm -hmm. as opposed to financial networks. But this is different. The theory behind this is, can we inoculate the financial system from rogue capital? Can we make it very hard for these actors, these rogue actors, to access the banking system, which is so critical to them? And so it took two years, but we finally got interagency agreement to move forward. In September 2005, the Section 311 rule comes out. Now, mind you, this rule is a d domestic regulatory rule. It was just a proposed rule. It actually wasn't even a final rule. It was not a UN-based sanction, wasn't done with the EU, wasn't done bilaterally. What happened in September of 2005, once that came out, was uh, a ripple effect that I think most people didn't anticipate. There was a closure of the bank, a run of the bank, the Macanese authorities took it over, a freezing of $25 million in North Korean accounts, but more importantly, a freezing out of North Korean activity around the world in the banking system, to include in China. You know, China, which has always been the fail-safe for the North Koreans, the banks in China did not want the taint of dealing with illicit capital tied to the North Koreans. And so even the Bank of China didn't want to deal with uh, the North Koreans and froze their accounts. And it was the first time in modern memory uh, that the North Koreans called the United States for the first time to talk. Uh, and for two years after that, uh, they started and ended every conversation with, we want our money back. No, and really what they wanted was entry back into the banking system. They wanted their financial reputation back, and they wanted to be able to access the financial system for all the things that they were doing. Now, there's a lot of arguments around this, and I've taken some criticism because some argue, well, this prompted the first nuclear test uh, from the North Koreans as a response. Um, my retort to that was they were already preparing for nuclear yeah. tests and they were waiting for an excuse. But the reality was this, this got their attention. And interestingly, Karen, it got the attention within the national security establishment. Because up until then, up until 2005, these were interesting tools and it was certainly having some effect on Al-Qaeda. Uh, but it wasn't quite clear that this was a new brand of warfare or that these were new tools. But the fact that you got the North Koreans um, attention, and you're actually able to lock them out of the financial system after decades of sanctions, uh, awoke the national security establishment. And by this time, I was at the White House, so I, I witnessed this directly. People understood that there was something different about this power, something to be leveraged, and something to be learned. Uh, and it's exactly that paradigm that has been used against Iran. And it's exactly why, Karen, when the Iranians talk about relief from sanctions, 
first thing they want is to be plugged back into the banking system. They want back into the banking <coughs> system. And that's exactly why. And they haven't figured out a way to have an alternative banking system that's hidden or different or? They're trying. Uh, and, and this is uh, this is a reality of this environment. This this is not a static, binary kind of set of policies. This is a fluid ecosystem where money's always going to find a way to flow. You know, terrorists are going to find a way to move money, even if you close their accounts or shut down front companies or charities or, or what have you. Um, the same goes for countries. They're going to find alternate ways to do business. Uh, the Iranians have tried to build bartering arrangements. Uh, with their neighbors, tied to their oil trade, um, somewhat tied to gold, the use of gold. Uh, they've used cash more often. They've used the promise of their reserves uh, to try to engage in trade. Uh, but the reality is, without the connectivity into the banking system, and because of the reputational risk and suspicion of doing business with Iran, given all of the enforcement measures, given all of the, the efforts from the Treasury Department, Department of Justice, and others, um, the private sector just does not want to touch things that touch Iran. To include private sector actors in places like India and China and Turkey, uh, which are na natural outlets for Iran. And so there's no question that they're f trying to find ways around these strictures, and they do. But to the extent that it's more expensive, costlier, riskier, um, that works to our benefit. And even with all of that, they are struggling. And it's exactly why I think you've seen the charm offensive from President Rouhani, and it's exactly what has, I think, drawn them back to the negotiating table uh, that we're watching as we speak. I mean, we've had at least four events on Iran, closed events, <clears throat> in the past, I don't know how many months, and this is very clear that the sanctions are really hurting. And, and that was true a year ago, so that's interesting. I wanted to ask a little bit about, you know, when you talk about the military, the United States is the big player in the room, right? When you talk about counterterrorism, and on a lot of levels, we're a big player in the room. When it comes to the banking system, it's the, and, and finance in general, it seems to me that it's a more, it has to be a more collaborative effort. So how does that play out? How would you compare it to these other superpowers that we have? How does it play out in the Treasury realm? It's a, it's a great question because it, it raises the issue of how do you sustain the power and also, how do you share it, potentially, with rising powers like China and Russia? Um, the reality is that these powers work, in large part, because we still are the dominant economic and financial player in the world. In some ways, we've set the standards. The Bretton Woods regime you know, is a, is a US-driven uh, set of norms internationally. The anti-money laundering system itself is an American-European construct as to what is legitimate uh, commercial and financial activity, the know your customer rules, the, the due diligence rules, all of that is sort of an American and, and European construct. Um, and in many ways, the, the fact that we're able to isolate actors from that financial system, to define legitimacy and then to exclude actors from it, is based in part on the role of the dollar as the reserve currency still around the world, as well as the, the attraction of the US as a key capital market, and in particular New York. Uh, so New York and the dollar are key financial and strategic assets for the U.S. And the health of the economy uh, and the strength of the economy becomes then a, a, an underlying power base for the U.S. And so it's not just do we have our house in order, uh, are we going to be indebted to the Chinese. That's all important. But it's really a fundamental question as to whether or not our economy, our currency, our capital markets actually are attractive enough to enable us then to drive the definition of what it is to be a legitimate actor in that system. Because if people want to do business in the United States, if they want to be a global player, they have to do business here. And that means you have to play by our rules. Um, and to the extent that we're not able to drive that debate, either because we're viewed as overbearing, illegitimate, or our capital markets are less important, and 2008 had a, a real effect on that, um, then we are weaker. Uh, in terms of our national security, and certainly weaker in our ability to use these authorities and powers. So you finally sell this to the White House and to the national security establishment, larger, um, about how important Treasury is and its, the tools it has in this global war we're in. Um, is that the pattern now? Does it still have a, a home? Is it still considered a, a, a useful tool, or has it changed in, in recent years? 
Well, there's no question now that the debate has turned from back in 2002, 2003, why is Treasury here, they shouldn't be here, to why isn't Treasury here, where are they? Yeah. Mm -hmm. right? And so that's, that's a fundamental shift. And I saw that time and time again in the Situation Room. You know, we need Treasury here, what is the strategy on this? Because the interesting thing about these powers and the role of Treasury is it fills very neatly this notion of smart power. You know, what do we have between diplomacy and military power? Um, you can say, look, we've got soft power, and you know, I, I wear a Mickey Mouse watch because I love the power of Disney. That, that's great. But in terms of actually enforcing our will or moving strategies that are uh, helpful to our national security, we don't have that many tools in the toolkit. This fills a huge gap in that center so that when people ask, well, how do we deal with the hard, hard thorny issues facing the U.S. government or the international community, especially if we don't want to go to war again, and especially if we realize that just talking isn't going to do much, there has to be a sense of what can we do to build leverage. And this, in many ways, builds leverage. And the interesting thing about the evolution of Treasury and these powers is you see Treasury sort of developing these tools and, and relationships and awareness on its own, but it also then becomes a complement to other powers. And so it becomes a complement to military power with the whole development, and you've heard this term, Karen, of threat finance, which is how the Department of Defense now talks about these issues. How do you get at the money that's allowing the insurgents to shoot at our uh, men and women in uniform? That's threat finance. You need Treasury to help do that. Diplomacy. This gives the teeth to our diplomacy. And so, uh, you know, you're going to have a sanctions official or a Treasury official who are, who's a part of these delegations talking to the North Koreans or the Iranians. Because it's those technical tools that really get the attention of the other side. With law enforcement, it's a force enabler. You look at, for example, uh, the DEA's investigation of Hezbollah money laundering, the huge case tied to the Lebanese Canadian Bank in Canada with hundreds of millions of dollars going through from drug traffickers in South, uh, South America, uh, car, used car dealers in West Africa, and used car dealers in the United States. How uh, did the DEA try to impact that? They paired with the Treasury Department to go after that key bank to try to isolate it, and that bank is no more, and Hezbollah is scrambling for alternatives. And so what's interesting in the development of this is Treasury not only regained a seat at the table for the use of its own powers, but it became clear to others around the table that these are very important and interesting tools that can amplify their own powers and authorities. Interesting. When you went to the White House, did any, did your perspective change? Or was it just sort of a linear, was there anything you thought? I've talked to others who, who go from one part of the government to the White House and they say, oh, I never really saw the whole picture, now I get it. Did you have that moment? Did you feel like it was, or not? <clears throat> A little bit. I mean, you, you certainly, my job changed dramatically from Treasury to, to the White House. And so at the White House, I had the full counterterrorism portfolio and all the transnational threat issues. And so everything from piracy to uh, drug gangs in you know, Central America and the Merida issue. That's cool. So it's sort of a broader scope. Um, but what was interesting in that regard was there was a similarity in terms of how one views the world through a treasury lens and through the lens of illicit finance and how you view the lens when you're focused on non-state networks that present a threat to the United States, which in essence was my portfolio at the White House. And it's actually interesting because if you view the le through the lens of illicit finance and the flows of monies and the relationships that, that build, it actually gives you a unique view in the world because you're not just focused on one country or one potential enemy or one set of issues. You're actually looking at the global landscape very differently. And it's interconnected in a way that you may not see otherwise. And so I, I think I was advantaged by coming from a Treasury background, having viewed the world that way, and then going to the White House to say, look, we've got to worry about the relationship between transnational organized crime groups and terrorist groups. We've got to worry about the Victor Boots of the world. Um, we've got to worry about uh, the, the criminality of these states. You know, Moises Naim calls them the mafia states. We've got to worry about those things. We've got to worry about the link between piracy, maritime security, uh, Somali, um, you know, state sovereignty, and the rise of al-Shabaab. All of that's interconnected. So um, I was advantaged because I had viewed the world 
through that lens and was now able to, to sort of take that vision into my White House role. Um, you know, as you started in the Department of Justice, I'd like to, and we're at a law school, I'd like to return to that a little bit because the way you've been talking is very much about criminality and, and, and seeing this not so much as you're going to prosecute them, these guys, but, but somehow this is a criminal framework. Um, what does that mean in terms of using these tools for, as a criminal framework, but not necessarily thinking about apprehending these individuals? Or you know, how do you think about it in terms of the, the criminal endpoint? That's a great question. Um, I think the, the, the first step in, in thinking about these powers, in particular, in the evolution post 9 11, and I know we've had huge debates about this, Karen, is thinking about different paradigms that are beyond criminal limitations. Um, and so one of the frustrations we had, for example, in the USS Cole case was uh, we knew who the perpetrators were, but we knew we weren't going to get at them. Or the two who were in custody were going to be released or their interrogations were going to get stopped and Bob McFadden was going to be thwarted if we were trying to do our jobs. So the question is, how can you influence um, competitors or enemy actors in ways that um, give the U.S. leverage that reinforce the sense of legitimacy and that in some ways does what the criminal legal system does in terms of holding people accountable, but what are, what are additional ways and tools of holding groups or networks accountable for uh, maybe illicit behavior or very dangerous behavior. Uh, and I think in the post 9-11 world that has been one of the fundamental shifts which is how can we think about the use of multiple tools and frameworks to not only defend the country but also to impact the networks and the nation states that actually threaten us. Um, and in some ways, it's a great question you ask because one of the major points of division and conflict that we've had, for example, with our European partners is that in terms of the use of these kinds of authorities, for example, freezing assets preventatively, not people, the key question is, well, what's, what's the new process, either ex ante or post facto? From the European mindset, this should all be done from a criminal legal perspective. Uh, this should look like a, a criminal or civil seizure process. Uh, we had a very different view, which was this is actually part of a new wartime structure, but we're going to take actions preventively. We're going to do it judiciously and carefully. These are extraordinary powers. Uh, but we're, we're going to have to act preventively in a way that, that actually tries to defend the country. Now, that's created some controversy and some uh, consternation diplomatically, and in particular with the European Union. Uh, but that is a difference of approach and a difference between sort of use of classic criminal standards and uh, procedures, which I advocate. I think we need to use them and use them aggressively. And in fact, we need to re relearn the lessons of the use of criminal tools to get at some of the evolving problems we have. So don't get me wrong. I'm all for it and I'm a prosecutor at heart. But we also need to think differently and aggressively about how we use these other tools to include soft suasion. You know, how can we use uh, elements of an environment, especially the post-Arab Spring environment, to our advantage? And that may not be the use of any official tools at all. I think it's really interesting. I think this idea of being somewhere between diplomacy and warfare, somewhere between law enforcement and intelligence, um, you know, following the money. And so really what you're saying is that you've created um, food treasury a new way of intersecting with the world, which takes on the non-state actor as well as the state actor in the same in the same vein. I think it's it's interesting. And so on that note of mine saying it's interesting, why don't we open it? I have a zillion more questions, but why don't we open up to your questions? Joshua? Hi. Uh, and I'm not quarreling, quarreling with the larger objective or the or even the, uh, the strategy, but in terms of inside treasury and inside the government, is there consciousness, and if there's consciousness of it, is there a reconciliation for the inconsistency of the application of these tools? And what I mean by that is, so for example, if it's the Taliban in the 90s, let's say, individuals who provided support to the Taliban get prosecuted criminally, go to jail for 30 years. Saudi Arabia provides millions, hundreds of millions of dollars to the Taliban and gets aid from the United States. Riggs Bank, a piggy bank for all sorts of sanctioned people, no criminal prosecutions, other smaller groups of people 
get prosecuted. Uh, Somali using a hawala goes to jail for an extended period of time. Other people, you know, and, and, other, and even in the Palestinian context, charities giving to the very same institutions, some get prosecuted, some don't. The ones that get prosecuted are Muslim charities. The ones that don't are sort of more Christian or, you know, white person charities. So I'm curious whether there's a consciousness of that at Treasury and how it's reconciled if, if there is a consciousness. It's a great, great question, and I'm glad you raised it. Um, there is a deep consciousness of that. I mean, one of the things um, that I was sort of tasked to do, but also wanted to do post 9 11, was do a lot of outreach to Muslim American communities for precisely the reason you described, which was there was um, a lot of anger, animosity, uh, misunderstanding as to what we were trying to do with these tools, in particular with, with Islamic charities, um, and in particular with the Holy Man. Relief and Development, uh, Holy, Holy Land Foundation for Relief and Development, sorry. Um, and so there's no question there was consciousness of the impact. Um, the reality, though, is that there had to be kind of a shift of, of modality post 9 11 across the board. And it, that went for Saudi Arabia, too. I mean, I detail in chapter three of the book um, how intense and difficult those discussions with the Saudis were because there was no question in the 80s and 90s. There had uh, been built up an infrastructure to support the Mujahideen movement, and in particular to, to oust the Soviets, but also residual elements of it, uh, whether it was in Southeast Asia or other parts. And so those are very difficult conversations. Uh, one of the interesting things, though, is that um, I'm convinced that if the Treasury Department had not been focusing on these issues, we would not have gotten to some of those hard and thorny issues with the Saudis about what it means to fund Wahhabi causes around the world that could form the backbone for certain al-Qaeda groups and, and elements. It was only because we were worried about terrorist financing that we actually put those issues at the top of the agenda, agenda with the Saudis while we were dealing with everything else that, that uh, the U.S. and Saudi relationships about. Um, final point on the, on the balance. Uh, th there is a big question here about how these financial tools and integrity is enforced. And there's no question that there's a, that there's a sense of uh, injustice by some, and there's also a sense of um, lack of proportionality. Uh, and you've seen this in some of the tension between the Treasury and the Department of Justice uh, with respect to who's going to enforce elements of the anti-money laundering laws against financial institutions or others. Um, and a bit, bit of tension there. Uh, and so there's no question that there is a dynamic within the U.S. government trying to figure out what is the right balance for how you enforce uh, these laws and these measures. I would say, though, uh, with respect to Riggs, I often hear uh, both Riggs wasn't prosecuted and these banks don't get hit very hard with fines. In this period, what matters most to banks is their reputation. And it's reputational risk that in some ways became the coin of the realm, also for charities and other organizations, but really for banks. Um, and the, the reason that Riggs Bank, once known as the most important bank in the most important capital of the world, doesn't exist anymore. It's not because of the $25 million fine that they were fined uh, by uh, officials. It was because of the reputational impact uh, that they had banked Pinochet, that they were banking Equatorial Guinea, and then they had investigations underway because of the Saudi accounts that they had held, uh, which unleashed the whole issue of who, who gets to now bank the embassy uh, bank accounts, which is a big issue still to this day. Um, the final point, there is, a, there is a potential tipping point here, and I raise this at the back of the book, where what we've done is we've put on the backs of the private sector the role of being the guardians of the financial system, the guardians of the gate. And there are limitations to that. There are limitations to not only what we can ask of the private sector as a government, but also what the impact of that is. Because if, at the end of the day, we're asking the private sector to completely de-risk from any risk, and it's not about a risk-based anti-money laundering system, which is the way it's, it's built, but instead a zero-tolerance enforcement modality, where if you get your, your hand caught in the cookie jar, it's going to get cut off, um, then that creates a very different environment, where legitimate banking actors decide they're not going to do business with the Somali remitters, they're not going to do business with embassy bank accounts, they're not going to do business in risky places around the world. And so what you do is you end up limiting the sense of who's a legitimate actor and what is included in the legitimate banking world 
and you start to cede that zone to less scrupulous, less responsible actors, which is a real risk that I see actually now coming because of the overuse per perhaps of some of these tools in some instances. So those are good questions. Hi, um, thanks very much for writing your book and, and also for your service. Um, I just want to ask you a little bit about the, the Cotty case, which you allude to very briefly. Um, and for those of you who don't know what that case is, it's one of the sort of pivotal cases uh, brought in the European Court of Justice having to do with sanctions and designation um, that seem to be a sort of turning point uh, in some ways for um, how future cases might be fought in the EU uh, and also brought about the the creation of the ombudsperson uh, to oversee uh, the sanctions for the 1267 regime. And I wonder what you'd say about, one, how the ombudsperson is doing, uh, what might need to be improved there, uh, and also, um, you know, this flood of cases, I think about 30, uh, that are very similar to the Audi case that might actually become another kind of tipping point. Yeah. Another great question. Um, of your audience. We have the best awesome. Audience. <laughs> I was anticipating this one. It's a, it's a great question, um, and yet something I raised in the, in the book, because the challenges to the use of targeted sanctions across the board, not just in the terrorist financing context, for example, the Cadi case, but also with respect to Iranian banks, um, which is some of those designations have now been overturned, um, is really putting at risk um, the European Union system of the use of targeted sanctions across the board. And so what evolved in the 1990s as a, an attempt at, at the use of smarter sanctions to target individuals or regime leaders and evolved and was put on steroids after 9-11 to go after the networks that, that concerned us, the banks that concerned us, is now under stress. And I think those cases represent a real question of whether or not the European system can withstand the challenges because what's at play is what we were talking about earlier, Karen, which is the question of what is due process um, and what is adjudication for purposes of the use of these kinds of financial tools. Um, and the argument being made by those who are challenging their listing and others who are advocating for them is that you have to have a system that has adjudication up front. You have to have a trial-like system that allows some sort of due process, some, some way for the individual or the entity to challenge the accusations. The U.S. model is, is flipped. If you look at all the executive orders based on IEPA, uh, the International Economic Emergency Powers Act, it is a post facto due process because the, the risk is of asset flight. And the whole point is you arrest assets preventively. And so you can't sort of open up a court or administrative process and hope to actually do anything in advance. And so. The, the real issue then, and it led to the creation of the Ombudsman, which for those of you who don't know is a, a fairly unique position at the UN to actually help adjudicate delistings. So if somebody is listed um, as being a terrorist financier or supporter of the Taliban or, or Al-Qaeda under the 1267 regime, um, there is a delisting process. This Ombudsman is supposed to help with that process. In some ways, be an adjudicatory person, uh, help with the, with the you know, logistics, and to help with the interplay between individuals and nation states. Um, and it's a bit of an odd role because what you have is the UN is a, is a member state body, but what you have is you're trying to figure out what you do with individuals' cases in a body that isn't a judicial body. And so you have these, these uh, attempts to create these sort of artificial uh, individuals and, and functions to actually get at some semblance of due process. I'm a, I'm a big fan of the delisting process. The U.S. has one uh, through OFAC. Um, we've argued that it needs to be replicated around the world. People do have to have real due process. Uh, and if you're going to have this system where it's post facto, it better be rigorous and transparent and real. Uh, and I think the Ombudsman is an attempt to give the U.N. at least a little bit of that flavor of due process at least for the 1267 context. I think as uh, Karen knows, my law firm frequently represents uh, documentary filmmakers and investigative reporting networks. And uh, many of them are often rather surprised um, when they're advised about OFAC regulations. <laughs> 
and uh, get a license. <laughs> compliance. Um, and and so your comment about the um, uh, criminalizing of the of the uh, nature of the regulations uh, interested me because on a certain level of granularity, um, the effect of these licensing obligations have been to license the free press in the United States. And, um, I'm wondering whether there's been, um, and, and incidentally, there, certainly the OFAC regulations have been very effective in preventing certain criminal conduct um, done by bad state actors, but they've also had the effect of interfering with investigative reporting and uh, documentary filmmaking um, that um, is designed to enhance transparency and accountability. So the question is, has there been some consideration by Treasury um, or interaction with the Office of Legal Counsel about whether or not some of these OFAC regulations are operating as de facto prior restraints on some of these activities? It's a great question. Um, adjudicated to a certain degree in the Holder case um, and um, came out in favor of the, of the US government, obviously, in that, in that regard. Uh, you know, I'm, you know, I'm, I'm a believer in the in these sanctions and the system, um, and I think to the extent that, for example, there's a group that's designated designated as a foreign terrorist organization, um, it is certainly within the purview of the, the U.S. government for national security purposes and, and otherwise to actually put restrictions on what U.S. citizens can do for or with those groups. Um, I don't think that's unreasonable. I take your point, though, that when talking about and I, and I work with social scientists who deal with the Hamases of the world and, and talk to Hezbollah and others, and so I get it. Uh, in fact, one close colleague of mine uh, and I disagree on this, but he's a very close and dear friend. Uh, we had dueling op-eds after the older uh, hearing uh, ruling. Um, but I, th I think there are ways around it um, if, if one is willing to live with that initial construct. If, if you're not, if you say, look, there, there's just certain fundamental rights that the government cannot restrict, uh, including my ability to talk to certain actors around the world, and I don't care what you've labeled them, then I think there's just a fundamental difference of opinion. And I think that's, in some ways, what the Holder uh, ruling was about. But I do think there are ways around it, creative lawyering, and I'm sure you've done some of it yourself, to try to get general licenses around certain types of activity uh, it's often hard to get licenses like that out of OFAC, but when you do, I think it opens up a wide swath of activity that then is acceptable and won't get people in trouble. So in, um, it's often said that law enforcement and intelligence folks approach things differently. You know, law enforcement wants to eventually wrap up a case and arrest people, and, and an intelligence perspective might be just to, to watch and listen and let it go and you know, learn as much as you can. I mean, it seems like there might be some of those tensions here. I mean, to the extent you're blocking and seizing and preventing people from accessing the financial system, you're also, I mean, you talked about with Walla and with gold and oil, you're also driving activities underground and harder to monitor channels. So, I mean, are, are, you, are you sort of losing an ability to understand networks and understand the, the entities that we're up against by driving finance underground in this way? Another great question. Um, those tensions were widely seen and felt uh, right after 9-11. So if you read the book, um, hopefully you do, um, there's some great scenes. Actually, my first interaction with Kofor Black, the famous uh, CIA counterterrorism chief, was a meeting at the Treasury to talk through uh, whether or not we were going to reveal certain names and entities that we wanted to designate. We wanted their assets frozen, but the CIA didn't. Uh, the CIA clearly wanted to continue to watch and learn monitor. Um, and so this is a dynamic tension. And in some ways, Treasury, to use your law enforcement intel model, Treasury kind of fits into both, but it also is, a, is an actor that comes even before those. Uh, in, the, in terms of the use of some of these regulatory tools and uh, sanctions tools, the Treasury actually, its instinct is to be open and, and notorious because the tools work best when the banks know about them, when, when financial institutions are aware of who the bad actors are, et cetera. But you have the very risk that you described, which is, well, you may be tipping off networks, you may be driving uh, things underground, you may uh, you know, jeopardize a law enforcement case. 
And so that's why the discussions around how you use these tools, how it gets integrated into broader strategies becomes very important. Um, and I will tell you that more often than not, we would lose those debates because uh, a law enforcement agency or an intelligence agency would come in and say, look, there are real equities here. We're going to burn sources. We're going to burn this case. It's not worth it. Uh, we'll get to the financial isolation, but let's do it in parallel. And, and usually at the end of the day, you came out with a better strategy. Um, uh, but you do have those inherent trade-offs. Um, that said, I, it, one thing that Karen mentioned is Treasury is a part of the intelligence community. And one of the interesting things that was built at the Treasury in 2004 was the first ever intelligence office within a finance ministry anywhere in the world. And so the, the role of that office is to develop financial intelligence. And so embedded in the DNA now of this new treasury, this new war, is actually a sense that we've got to gather and analyze financial intelligence. And it may just be that we're gathering and analyzing financial intelligence without taking action. Um, and it's interesting that the assistant secretary who runs that office reports not just to the secretary of the treasury, but also to the director of national intelligence, dual headed. It's really interesting. Can you talk for a minute, um, uh, before we run out of time, about um, the overlap with cyber <clears throat> and, and, and sort of where this is paradigmatic for how you see combating cyber? I know it's not the same thing, but just can you just riff on that a little bit? Sure. Um, maybe a couple of overlaps that are really interesting. I think there's a, an immediate and obvious material overlap because you're starting to see glimmers of cyber warfare that looks an awful lot like financial warfare. And what's interesting here is that the recent attacks over the last year and a half that you've seen on U.S. and Western banks, in particular denial of service attacks, uh, and then I would also include in that the Saudi Ramco attacks, are coming out of Iran and Syria. And I don't think it's any grand mystery as to why the banks are being hit. One, they're a fundamental element of the financial infrastructure that matters to the West, right? And so if Bank of America or uh, Standard Charter or other banks around the world are getting hit and are less efficient, less effective, that hurts the bottom line of, of the U.S. And of course, you've heard Al-Qaeda talk about the need to go after the U.S. economy, uh, the lessons learned from the fall of the Soviet Union. Um, and so there, there, there's an immediate overlap because what you see is that the banks are now They've not only been leveraged as a key part of this new form of financial warfare, they're now getting dragged into this new form of cyber financial warfare. And the banks are distressed about it. They're really struggling. Uh, and I think that's an interesting area to watch because in some ways it's going to be the interaction of the banks with authorities that will be the next phase of the cyber financial landscape. The other area that I think is interesting in terms of overlap is how we have thought about the use of and leveraging the financial sector for purposes of, of national security. I think one of, one of the reasons that this new power has worked and that it's been as effective as it has been is that we figured out that we needed to leverage the bottom line material interests of the banking community in particular, but other parts of the financial community, and parallel that with our national security interests. And our job was to prompt and to define uh, legitimate activity in that ecosystem and to prompt the private actors to do the right thing. That's the whole lesson of BBA, the Bangladesh Delta Asia action. We, we prompted the system and the private sector reacted on its own. That wasn't a UN sanction, that was the private sector reacting organically. And so there's a question that we've had all along the cyber context, which is how does the public sector and the private sector interact? And what does cybersecurity look like when 80% of the infrastructure is in the hands of the private sector and there is no clear modality or lines of relationship between the government and the private sector, though we know there has to be, because to secure our financial sector, our oil industry, our energy sector, our critical industries, the private sector has to be a part of it. They have to be the guardians at the gate of their systems. And so the question is, how do, how do we then develop modalities as to developing regulation, best practices, sharing of information in a way that perhaps parallels what we've done in this space. And I think that's an interesting... Uh, so that's my question. Is it parallel or can you actually build it on the backs of what we have? Or are we talking about 
building a whole new, you know, Department of Cybersecurity, or it can, is the terrorism model, to, to pick a name, is the terrorism model, the way it's um, enhanced the interagency process, the way it's reorganized the intelligence lines of communication, <clears throat> is that enough, or are we really looking at another, a whole other reorganization of government? I, I would say do not build another department, do not build another bureaucracy. Um, in some ways, and again, I mentioned this in the in the book. In some ways, um, this new environment where public and private have to interact more directly and more uh, in parallel actually gives the Department of Homeland Security a more important raison d'etre yeah. than even when it was created. Right? I'm, I'm less interested in the Department of Homeland Security that worries about terrorism because the FBI does that, the CIA does that. Um, we have to worry about borders and, and such. I'm more interested in a Department of Homeland Security that actually thinks about securing the key systems that our country and, and economy rely on and developing the modalities of how government and private sector actually work together to protect it. They've done it in some regards. In the, for example, the chemical industry, how to protect yeah. the nuclear industry. Um, but that's a reason for us to have a Department of Homeland Security actually. Uh, that goes well beyond Al Qaeda or whatever terrorist group uh, du jour we worry about. It's actually a, a, a concern about the systems and networks that make our country operate. We need a department actually to worry about that day in, day out, and the cascading impact of that. And that's actually a great role for the Department of Homeland Security. Because the NSA is not going to play that role, especially post Snowden. Um, DHS is going to have to fill that role, or somebody is. But I would say do not create a new bureaucracy. Um, let's figure out how to how to create the cooperation that you need, and frankly, the private sector is hungry for it, uh, as we know. It's interesting. It's sort of like if you build it, they will come. So we built it. Now let's do something with it. Um, we have time for a couple more questions. Jerry, uh, <coughs> thanks for your work. Um, I saw the the legacy of uh, thanks of. Uh, of some of the, the some of your institutional legacy in Treasury when I was uh, Treasury attaché in Baghdad in 06, 07. Um, I want to ask a question that that sort of takes a step back uh, to a kind of broader question, which which might initially sound uh, like it's broader than than the Treasury focus of your book, but I think I think a microcosm of this occurs in Treasury. Um, there have been a couple of narratives about the post-9-11 wars. One was the obvious war against terrorists, um, and the, react, the response there is to develop effective tools, full range of tools, uh, to, uh, to counter terrorists, whether military or financial uh, or uh, intelligence uh, or others. But another narrative, and these are not, uh, these coexist, uh, was that one of the things going on post 9-11, one of our objectives, uh, one of the problems was uh, fragile states. Um, and for that, in that narrative, the response was to strengthen these weak states. And uh, within Treasury, of course, uh, the, the counterterrorism tools that you, you've been talking about here joined uh, tools that already existed, uh, uh, parts of Treasury that advised um, on uh, uh, countries uh, on uh, macroeconomic policies during financial crises that provided technical assistance, etc. And so my question for you is, with the benefit of, of hindsight, looking back uh, uh, over the past dozen years, do you, do you have any new insight about sort of the balance between these, what, what you might call these offensive tools against terrorists and uh, what might be called kind of constructive tools uh, to strengthen. It's possible that we overestimated uh, our capacity uh, to develop effective constructive tools. Um, uh, but I, I'm interested in, in your perspective about how those two things look. Yeah, great question, and thank you for your service, especially out in Baghdad at a, at a really difficult time, uh, as, as you know well. Um, it's, it's a great point. Um, it's something I get into the tail end of the book because I think one of the failings that, that we had from a policy perspective was 
uh, not so much the inability to do what you described in terms of the capacity building, uh, working with central banks, working to rebuild banking uh, the systems, non-corrupt ways of paying public servants, all the things that Treasury did so well in a positive sense. But I think even in the context of uh, the financial warfare I described, what we didn't quite develop well enough, um, and I'll take some responsibility for this, because we were thinking about it, but we were never able to fully ex able to execute it, was a positive agenda that reinforced this, that sense of legitimacy. And so it, it was not just building capacity, not just building connectivity into the financial system, but also reinforcing that sense of legitimacy. I'll give you three quick examples. In the charities context, where we shut down charities that we knew were uh, part of a fund, funding network for Al-Qaeda, what we were never able fully to do was to figure out how do we backfill. Because we were literally closing charities around the world, bad, bad ones, but they were actually doing some good as well. There's no question. And so how do we service the orphans and the widows and the people that are actually being served by some of those charities? We have AID, we have uh, private sector actors. Why weren't we able to devise an architecture that had both sides of the coin playing at once? Um, with respect to banks, uh, we've often isolated bad banks, but not, why not reward positively banks by uh, developing uh, financial diplomatic strategies to reward the good actors in the system? So instead of banks losing business because they decide they're not going to do uh, they're not going to bank for the drug cartels or Hezbollah or others. Why don't they see an inflow of capital uh, from sovereign wealth funds and others as a positive uh, reinforcement to these tools? In terms of capacity building, you know, one of the ideas that we had that evolved into, into a private sector dialogue was how do we pair the banks that are a cut above in terms of compliance with mid-range and smaller banks that we know are going to have to be important players, especially in developing economies. How can we pair them in ways that actually build that organic team building sort of systemic uh, defense against the illicit finance? We weren't able to fully do that. I mean, that, that actually progressed further than, uh, than initially hoped, but not as far as I'd like. And so those are examples of even within the framework of what I'm describing, we need a positive agenda that actually complements the exclusionary and negative parts of our campaign. And it, frankly, it's a great way of balancing some of the impact uh, that we have that may be part of the negative externalities that we heard the first gentleman ask about. That is such a positive note that we're going to end on. <laughs> <laughs> because first, we're out of time, and I like to keep these at you know, an hour. But um, also because it's really, we never hear that. We really, we, we're, it's not for anybody's fault. It's just that we're so mired in focusing on the problems and trying to you know, approach them from the way we do. So I just want to end by saying that is the only defense of the Department of Homeland Security that I've ever heard that resonated in a, in a positive way on that positive note. And I encourage you not only to run, because I hear we're getting a new secretary sometime, but um, I think maybe a little op-ed in that saying what you said could be a very valuable thing. Thank you so much for complimenting the audience. Thank you so much.